I'm going to uh, present the results of a project that I did where we looked at using Google Drive in our department to develop a certain set of attributes among our students and we used authentic learning as a framework um, to, to use Google Drive in the classroom. Um, is everyone familiar with Google Drive? It used to be called Google Docs. Basically it's just an online um, word processing environment. There are other features and I'll show you a little bit about that but the emphasis is on the, the word processing features. So uh, some of the background is that um, well, let me tell you about the, the module that we use this in. In this particular module, it used to be lecture-based and it was very content-heavy. So we walk into a classroom and we basically talk to students for two hours about a set of conditions. And we say, these are important conditions that you need to be aware about as a physiotherapist. So if we take TB as an example, I walk into class and we, I basically tell students about TB for an hour. Right? So we know that that isn't a very effective way of of learning and we wanted to try something different so we spent a lot of time completely restructuring this particular module and we threw out everything and we started from scratch and we said that we would stop giving the students course readers so we gave them no content so we went from us giving them all the content to us giving them no content they used Google Drive to develop their own content through facilitation we and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about how we facilitated that process we went from me standing up here talking to them, to them doing all of the work in small groups. That's what Lindsay was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, we had to spend a lot of time helping them learn how to work in small groups. So looking at role allocation, uh, setting group norms, setting consequences for not following the, the, the rules of the group. Um, so we, we had to give them all of those skills before they could actually work effectively in groups. And I think that was um, kind of key to, to the success of it. Um, okay, so some of the background is that a lot of people look at knowledge as the substance that can be transferred between people. So I stand here and I talk to you and somehow you get the knowledge that I have. Um, and whereas we actually want our students to be able to use knowledge as a tool as part of a process. So you can know everything there is to know about TB, but if I give you a patient who has TB and you don't know what to do about that, then that's a problem. So we want them to use that knowledge, use those facts and that information as a tool that they can apply in a specific context. Um, we wanted them to go beyond knowing what and how. And we wanted to help them learn how to think. So we say that our, our physio students must be critical thinkers. They must be able to use clinical reasoning. And in the past, that's where we stop. And we kind of expect them to pick this up through some kind of osmosis, that they're going to somehow develop these skills. And critical thinking is something that's actually really hard. Um, so we wanted them to learn about that process as part of this module. We wanted to teach them how to think. We needed to uh, support open discussion, the questioning of assumptions. We wanted them to reflect. We wanted them to learn how to critically evaluate information. How it works in the past is we give them this thick course reader and we say, yeah, memorize as much of this as you can. And they just trust that everything in that course reader is right. That is what they need to know to be a successful physiotherapist. Again, sometimes when we go back over our own notes, we, we find mistakes, errors. We don't model to the students what we expect to see in their work. So referencing is inconsistent or there isn't any referencing. We've just made some random notes and we say, well, I know this to be true. But when the student does the same thing, we say, no, 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 you, who are you to know that this is true? You need to reference it. So we saw that there were a lot of problems in our own notes. We wanted the students to critically evaluate the information that they were given. So be able to say, well, hang on a second. You know, you tell me that I must do this thing, but you're not doing it. And we want them to do that. We want them to challenge us. Um, we wanted to see collaborative partnerships in, in our students. We wanted them to work together and we designed the module so that they would not be successful unless they did work together. So working as an individual would not enable you to be successful in this module. You had to work as part of a group. Um, and we know this in, in clinical practice. When we students work on a ward, they're part of a medical team. Um, and so if you think that success is determined by your ability to work alone, then that's a problem because you're not going to be able to function effectively in the team. So we wanted to uh, incorporate that into, um, into this module. 
And then we wanted communication and dialogue to be a big part of the module. So not just me standing talking to them, but we wanted a lot of interaction, a lot of discussion in both directions. Um, this uh, the study was done in the physiotherapy department last year. Um, we had identified problems with critical thinking and clinical reasoning in our student population, and that was from feedback from um, external examiners and our clinical supervisors. We moved from lectures to using cases. Uh, we used authentic learning as a framework, and I'm going to show you a few examples of how we actually used characteristics of authentic learning. Afterwards, I did focus groups, uh, two groups of six students, determined themes. Uh, we did an analysis of the, the results by two reviewers and an independent review by a third. Um, so uh, authentic learning, um, is, is everyone familiar with authentic learning or you've heard of it in some way? Okay, so authentic learning is just a, a framework developed by Jan Harrington and a few other people, but she's the, kind of the main name. Um, and the idea is that uh, it's not workplace-based learning. A lot of people confuse the two and they say authentic learning is the same as workplace-based learning. And it's not. Authentic learning is designed to be in the classroom. Okay, so it's not about saying we put students in a real-world context and expect them to learn in that real-world context. It is supposed to be in the classroom. But the idea is that you design activities that get students to think and behave as if it were the real world. So when we say critical thinking is important in the real world, in the hospital, in the clinical context, and then we put them in a classroom and we don't expect them to think critically, that's not authentic. We give them a task that is unauthentic. So now we're saying, okay, well, let's take our tasks and let's make them authentic so that students must think critically in order to complete the task. So uh, these are the cases. This is using Google Drive. This is a conversation that's happening in the comments among facilitators. There were two processes happening at the same time. The students were developing their own notes using Drive, and facilitators were designing cases. The cases couldn't be seen by the students before they were given access to the folder. So this is an example of, this is the case that the students would get. So we would print this out and give it to the students. And then this is us developing the case. Okay, so at this point, the students can't see this. We were developing the cases almost in real time. We were one or two weeks ahead of the students. And the reason that we did it that way is because we wanted to be able to identify problems that we were seeing in the classroom and then to be able to modify future cases based on those problems. So the case design was informed very much by what we were seeing in the classroom. The tasks need to be ill-defined. So real-world problems are not simple, they're not X problems. Because A, they're human, so human beings are complex. And they have interacting variables with different conditions. So we need to take all of those variables and the patient and everyone else in the medical team and medication that the, the patient is on and personal factors, family factors, all these things. And the student needs to be able to negotiate all of those different variables to be able to say, well, these ones are important, these ones are not. And what we were doing in the past is we were saying to students, yeah, memorize all of this, then you'll be okay. Okay, so we made our cases quite complex. We didn't tell them what the diagnosis was. So we would say, you have a patient who presents like this. Begin. We would be in the classroom with them. We went from having one lecturer in the classroom to having between six and eight facilitators in the classroom. And the facilitators would rotate between groups. And we did it that way so that the students wouldn't, they wouldn't believe that there's only one way to solve this problem. So they'd have one person come around and say, well, I might do it this way. And the next facilitator comes around and say, well, I would do it a different way. And we'd explain it to the students like a map. You can get to the same destination by taking different routes. So that's all that the facilitators are doing. The objective for the patient management is always the same. We can say that we want to improve respiratory function in this patient. So the objective is the same. But how we choose to do that is dependent on your own experience, your, your resources, what facilities you have in your institution. So we wanted this, the tasks to be ill-defined so that there could be many different solutions. Um, we wanted it to be chaotic and confusing because the students need to be able to learn how to negotiate uncertainty because the real world is uncertain. So if we give them these very simple tasks that they can fix and then they go out into the hospital and all of a sudden 
you know, how are they supposed to manage the real world? Because it doesn't fit into these neat little boxes. Uh, authentic tasks need to be resolved over time. So we, each case ran for about two weeks. Um, and the students would meet on different days. This is just an example showing how the, how the cases were split up on a timetable. Um, we need to have different perspectives. So this is just another example of the comments that you can see in Drive. Um, the point was that we'd have about five people designing the case. So instead of having one person designing a case and saying this is what the case should be like, we had many different people giving examples and ideas and suggestions about how the case should be constructed. So we had input from different perspectives which made the case more authentic and more interesting. Uh, the task must require collaboration. So one of the nice things about Drive is that you can say, show me a revision history of this document. So this is the, these are the notes that the students were developing based on the cases that we had given them. So in class, one person in the group had a, an internet connected laptop and they would be making notes within the group. They had to develop their own questions, they had to do their own research. We gave them resources, we said these are good online sources that you can query, these are the textbooks that we want you to get. The difference is that we didn't say you have to go out and buy the textbooks because the internet is an amazing resource. But we can't just say to students, here is the internet, you know, begin. So we had to teach them how to search, we had to teach them how to evaluate information, we taught them how to determine credibility in sources, because we couldn't just let them loose on the internet and say, you know, go ahead, be free, and, and use anything that you want. So we did encourage them to use the internet, but we spent a lot of time teaching them how to use the internet effectively. Um, and then we always encouraged textbooks. We said textbooks are our first price. If you can get the textbooks, you know, you can have a lot more confidence in those answers than if you go to the internet. So anyway, my original point was that each one of these colors represents a different student. And you can click on this one and you can say, show me everything that this student did on this document. Okay, so the tracking, the revision history in Google Docs is actually pretty good. And you can see who made what changes over time. There's timestamps, date stamps. And what, what it'll do is, if you click on this one, it'll re restructure this document and put in this color every change that that student made. So we could go back at the, end of a doc, at the end of a case and we could say, who are the students who contributed to this document? And did they contribute in a meaningful way? Reflection was required. Um, and one of the ways that we did that is, uh, so uh, we, gave, we gave feedback to the students in class. So classroom was not about content, classroom was about discussion. And they would make their notes and then we also gave feedback on their notes. So we were, we were engaging in a conversation in, in the classroom and in the online space. And the way that we gave feedback was to ask questions. So we didn't just say to them, this is wrong, you need a reference here. We highlighted a problem that we saw in their notes, possibly pointed out a resource, um, but also we asked questions. So the student was then expected to take that feedback and then make changes to the document. Um, so if you look at, as an example, they've written their management here. This is a common thing that we see in our students. Patient management and they'll say muscle tone. Now we know what they mean, but muscle tone doesn't tell me that the student understands what it is about muscle tone that's important for this patient. So the question that you ask is, I say memorizing this list will not help you with any patient you're likely to see. For each item, you should explain what it means in the context of this patient. So I'm not just saying to the student, muscle tone is an inappropriate um, answer to the case. I'm saying, you must be able to explain how muscle tone is important for this patient. Not for all patients, for this patient. So that reflection was important. They, they read our feedback and then they go back, they, they rework the documents, they get more feedback. So it was this back and forth. Um, each case was designed to integrate content from different domains. So there had to be a research component everywhere. Every day the students had to come up with a list of research questions. In order to do that, they had to identify gaps in their own knowledge. What do I know? What don't I know? What do I think I know? What do I need to check? So there was research, there was reflection. We brought in legal aspects of healthcare. 
um, you know, what does the law say in terms of management of this patient? Uh, we pulled in from other modules, so there was an anatomy component, always. There's always an anatomy component. So even though we don't teach those subjects, the students are still expected to engage with those other modules. If we're looking at physiotherapy management, for this patient, we would have to say, okay, now refer back to your physiotherapy techniques notes. All right? What are the physiotherapy techniques you're aware of that are appropriate for this patient? So we weren't teaching them decontextualized knowledge. It wasn't just about saying, this is TB, you need, to, you need to know about TB. We were pulling in from all these different domains to say, how are you integrating all of this stuff so that you can understand this patient? Uh, formative assessment was built into the activity as part of the classroom experience, but then I've also shown how it was as part of the online experience. So it was always formative feedback, all right? And the feedback was always designed to say to the student, what steps are you going to take next so that you can improve the work that you've done. Uh, they had to create products. At the end of each week, every group had to come up with a presentation of their work for the week and they had to present it to the rest of the class. The rest of the class was then responsible for pointing out mistakes, omissions in their notes as well as us. So you had the facilitators who were doing kind of quality control. We were watching their presentations. These were summaries. But you had the rest of the class also saying, well, our management for this patient was different. You know, how do you explain that? Um, we came up with a different pathology. You know, how do we explain that? And then the students had to meet and they had to resolve the difference. They had to resolve the conflict. Right? And oftentimes they found that there was no conflict. It was just a different way of looking at the problem. But these products that they, they had to create, these then became the summary of the course content. And your task should also have multiple solutions. Okay? There should be multiple ways of being right. Okay, so what we found is that using this particular, these are the results of the focus group that I then held afterwards. What we found is that there were transformed student perceptions around learning. So if we just kind of go through these, these are just some of the responses. Um, the student says, it changed the whole thing. It forced me to understand why I would do this instead of that. So we would ask them those kinds of questions. Why do you choose this technique? Why not this technique? The student had to be able to critically evaluate their own choices. Um, when I come to write tests, it just comes like it's a part of me. Okay, so the students had a different um, conception of what it means to know. Um, being a student used to be like a job. I would come here, knock out a two, and that's it. Right? Nothing to do with learning. It redefined what learning was. It's not a classroom thing, it's a daily thing. It's, it's something that I do all the time, that I think about all the time. It's not just learning from a book, it's trying to find out how to learn. And I think that's something that we intentionally um, designed into the module. We didn't want to just say to them, you need to know these facts about TB. We were trying to get them to actively think about how they learn and how to learn better. So we went from saying that the content is the end, the, the, um, the, the end, oh, what am I trying to say? The content wasn't the thing that they had to focus on. The content was the thing that we used to teach them other things. Okay? So we used content to teach them how to critically evaluate their own knowledge, to learn how to ask research questions, to learn how to do research. So the content wasn't the end of, the, of the, the module. The content was just a tool that we used to achieve more meaningful objectives. We saw changing power relationships as part of learning. So when we stopped lecturing to the students and started discussing patient scenarios with them, we would say to them, how did you do this? This is how I would do it. So we were engaging more as more experienced and less experienced peers than lecturer and student. Uh, I found that we've got something to learn from each other. Even a lecturer has something to learn from students. I think it has a lot to do with the interaction. Um, I know that you're not going to think I'm an idiot. So students d don't ask questions in class. I'm sure that that's not just something that we see in our classrooms. And one of the reasons is that they are afraid. They're afraid that we're going to point out what they do not know. So one of the things that we used to do is we used to model not knowing in class. So when the students asked me a question, I made a point of saying, I'm not 100% sure, I'm just going to go and check with so-and-so. So it made it safe for the student to not know. Because if I don't know and I have to check, well then surely it must be okay for them to not know. So that was where that 
that quote came from. She says, I can ask questions because I know that you're not going to think I'm an idiot. Um, the level of superiority has been reduced. You're interested in things that I know. I know something. I have something to say. Um, you open your mind to a new way of thinking. And uh, we saw that there was development of critical thinking. Students are more confident challenging ourselves, challenging themselves. They say, we're not just going to accept things. We're going to challenge ourselves and think further because we don't just want to know the basics. Um, you have to ask why every time you see something, every time you face a challenge, every time you see something, why is this happening? Why is it happening this way? It allowed me to scrutinize what my lecturers teach me and open that door. They're not always right. They don't know everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for me, those are very powerful learning outcomes. And I think the students realized a lot of things about how learning happens. So what we realized at the end is that Google Drive is an appropriate platform for collaborative development of learning activities. So we developed the learning activities as a team. Authentic learning is a useful framework for developing activities in clinical education. Students demonstrated changes in their perceptions of learning. We saw changes in power relations as the students were facilitated or enabled to take control of their learning. And we saw that they developed critical attitudes towards knowledge and authority. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have about five minutes for questions or comments. Does anybody like to jump in? Um, I think Google Drive is an amazing uh, tool for teaching. I'm interested in, um, when you said you made points them about the internet and you didn't give them <coughs> uh, resources, what end, uh, ended up on Google Drive? And were there some copyright issues around access and the stuff that they may have put on? Yeah. Could you just talk a Definitely. Bit so, I mean, in the first case, basically, Every student said, right, I'm just going to go and copy and paste this Wikipedia page and, and put it into the notes. Okay, so the, there's a couple of things that um, were interesting is that we could pick out on almost every occasion when that happened because students are not very good at, at covering their tracks. So we saw um, a lot of examples of that. And, and what we did is we, we would say to them, now, how does this help you better understand this patient? Right, so we used a made it a learning teaching moment rather than a punishment moment. So we would say to the students, okay, now you need to take this. Now you need to go through this and you need to extract all the relevant pieces of information for this patient. Then you need to write that up as a short summary. Then you need to appropriately reference the source. By the way, I don't think that this Wikipedia page is a good source for this reason. So we'd end up writing a massive comment next to what the students had pasted in there. But it wasn't just saying, I'm going to send you to the disciplinary commission or committee because you copied this. Right? We were actually saying to them, right, now you've done this thing, how are you going to fix it? Right? How are we going to move from where you are to where you need to be? So we spoke a lot about information management, um, integrating ideas from multiple sources. Um, yeah. uh, one, one of the assignments that we gave as part of this module the very first assignment that we gave them was to say, right, here are two articles that you need to read. The two articles were about um, determining credibility in sources. And whether they were online or offline or print, it doesn't matter. The students had to go through those articles and they had to determine a set of criteria that they would use to determine credibility in a source. Then we gave them the Wikipedia article on hematoma, which was related to the case that they were doing and which would come up when they searched for hematoma. And then we said to them, right, now you go to this article, and using your criteria, you decide if it's an appropriate source. And all the students came back and said, we can't use this Wikipedia article. So they're actually very good at being able to determine whether or not they can use a source, but we need to help them learn how to make those decisions. So yes, we did see a lot of plagiarism, and that lasted for maybe, maybe the first two or three cases. And now we don't see, we, we hardly see it at all. And if it is, it's usually a student who's copied a small paragraph, pasted it in, and forgotten to go back and rework it. My question really, sorry, was, was about the other way around. It was about using um, resources that ended up, other people's work that ended up in 
on your Google Drive site as a resource. So yeah. not plagiarism per se. But so that wasn't the answer, was it? No, I mean, are you talking about things like photographs and yeah, and that? Just the stuff, whatever. I mean, everything that we do is just they're, they're taking it from um, journal articles, textbooks. So the only problem that we had was with citation yeah. issues when they had basically just copied and pasted um, work and not giving attribution. We didn't run into any licensing issues with copyright. Um, that it's just not the nature of this particular module. Uh, 60. 60. And you, you have six facilitators. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic um, teaching experience that you've created, but I think it's quite labor intensive. It's incredibly labor intensive. Uh, it takes a lot of time. We actually had to, at some point, we, we <coughs> changed it so that we said there were two facilitators who we said, okay, you don't come to classroom anymore. In this two hour period, you sit in your office and you give feedback to the students on drive. So we actually had to build time into their workload to, to do this. Because what we found is that you would, if, you were, if you had to be in classroom for those two hours, you're not going to go home and spend an hour working on the students' notes because that's not part of your workload. So even though we like to think that you know, teachers are just going to do this stuff because it's, you know, it's good for the students, we needed to be realistic in terms of what we can expect from our lecturers. So we built time into their workload um, to make sure that they had time to do it. But it was very resource intensive. And now we're running into the problem of how do we scale? Because this was in one class. This year, we did it for the second and the third years. Next year, we'll do it for the second, third, and fourth years. So it is only one module. But as the students are learning the process, we need fewer facilitators in the classroom. We need to give less feedback about the kind of structural technical issues. So we don't have a lot of feedback anymore about how to structure a set of notes, how to use headings to create a set of a table of contents. So those kind of technical issues we don't see anymore. And what we're going to actually do next year is we're going to experiment with our fourth years. So this was a group of second years last year. Now they're in third year. Next year they're in fourth year. We're going to design a mentoring program for this module where our fourth years are going to be giving feedback to the second years. <coughs> So when we graduate, our fourth years will graduate, become comm service physios, and they will be responsible for supervising students. But they've never been in a situation where they've had to supervise anyone. So now we're saying, okay, can we use this module to teach them how to give feedback, how to improve someone's learning? Um, and so our fourth years are going to give more of the kind of structural feedback, not, not the content stuff, but more structural things. And we're going to try and build a mentoring program where our fourth years can be looking at second year work. Because you're right, it, it's very difficult to scale. And, if, and once you start getting bigger classes, it's, it's more and more difficult. We actually, we had ICS install a, a wireless router in our department to make sure that all of the rooms, all of the venues in the department have wireless access. Students could bring in laptops, tablets, <coughs> phones, all of that was encouraged. And uh, interestingly, in their groups, they policed themselves. You know, we didn't say, hey, that's Facebook. We actually, I never saw Facebook. The, if the students were on their phones or tablets or computers, it was work-related. And when, a, when a, a message would come in and somebody would be on their phone, the students in the group were saying, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this is my time that you're wasting. Okay, so the students were policing themselves. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>